Hi everybody, uh, Matthew Gosdell back again uh, today giving a talk on constructive procedural content generation. Once again, this is a lecture for the Game AI class out of the University of Alberta. Let's go ahead and get going. So first off, again, if you're in the class, here's a link to the questions that you'll need to answer for the class. Uh, I'll just wait here a minute so people can see. The easiest one's gonna be tinyurl.com slash guzpcg3. Okay, that seems like enough time. Let's go ahead and get going. So as a review, last time, aka on Friday, we talked about search-based PCG. We talked about a few different approaches. We talked about greedy hill climbing, basically just always trying to go to the next best thing. We talked about the way that fitness functions and neighbor functions impact the performance of this algorithm, primarily through a Unity example. We talked about random walks and how those can help us to get out of the problem of getting stuck in local maxima. As a greedy hill climbing approach, we'll get stuck at the top of a smaller hill, even if what we're trying to find is the best hill in the space. Then we talked about simulated annealing, which can be thought of as sort of the easiest combination of greedy hill climbing and random walks. And then we talked about genetic algorithms, which are by far the most popular search-based PCG approach. Though we talked about again, even then, they're not widely popular uh, as an approach for doing PCG. What is, is constructive PCG, which is what we'll be talking about today. So as a review, uh, constructive PCG can be thought of as sort of uh, all the methods for building up PCG content piece by piece. Uh, I give an example here of, um, I guess these are Diplobox or Lego blocks, but you can think of them as being equivalent, right? Anytime that we have individual pieces that can be strung together with certain slots to be able to create larger structures. That's constructive PCG. The individual pieces here could be like pieces of a statue, like in the example I gave last week. They could also be pieces of a story or of a song or of a video game level or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The slots uh, are filled in by tokens. The tokens are generally hand authored. These are like the individual things. So like the building blocks in this case would be tokens. The slots would be the slots you can use to fill things in. And the rules would be how can these things be combined together? Constructive PCG, as I mentioned, is by far the most popular PCG method among actual game devs. Uh, we'll talk about that why exactly in just a little bit, but I think it will become clear as we go through the different approaches. Uh, <laughs> just kidding. I should have looked one slide ahead. Why so popular is coming up right now. So uh, let's think about this in comparison to search-based PCG, which is our only touchstone right now. For one, constructive PCG is much more controllable. In search-based PCG, we're basically locked into only altering the fitness function, and that's it, right? We could also change things like the neighbor function and what you initially started with when you were initially creating random levels, but you didn't have a lot of control. In a constructive approach, though, I control everything. I control the building blocks, right? I can swap out a building block if I don't like it. I control the rules. I can say if I don't like the way that these two things combine, I can just write a rule. Uh, say they can't combine, et cetera, et cetera. We showed how in uh, search-based approaches, at least for the greedy search approach that we had the unit example for, if I tried to write an explicit rule, like for example, uh, the first three columns of a level have to be of a certain height, that can often break a search-based approach, right? Uh, they're much faster. So a search-based approach has to search through a space which means it has to go through a lot of complete pieces of content before it might find the one it returns. But a constructive approach just builds, right? It, we start from somewhere and we just build until we're done and then we're done. So we are O of to the size of, you know, the number of decisions we're making, the number of slots that we're filling. And that's it. Uh, so it's very, very fast. And it's often much more intuitive. Um, when people are creating things, they don't generally create an entire thing and then look at tweaking it, right? They're generally building something up piece by piece by piece, right? Now you can think of like editing maybe as being more like a, a search-based approach, but even then you're not thinking about for say, um, let's say you're writing a paper for a class, for example, you're not thinking about, let's write a paper, now let's imagine every possible alternate version of this paper and pick the next best one, right? 
it's still the case that you're making simple local changes. So a constructive approach tends to be a lot more intuitive, especially for designers who may not even have any computer science knowledge whatsoever. So as I mentioned last week, constructive PCG is used for basically any kind of generation problem, whether that's game spaces like Remnant from the Ashes, a uh, I think criminally underrated game, or Minecraft, the much more popularly <laughs> popular and maybe criminally overrated. Uh, I don't know if that's that's like a gaming sin to say. To game scenarios like in Elsinore and Skyrim, and game bits like in uh, the Borderlands series or with the tool speed tree. So let's actually start with constructive PCG for game spaces because I did an actual example of constructive PCG for game bits with the statue generation in last week's um, last week's example. So constructive PCG for game spaces, these are things like game levels, dungeons, things you move through as the player. This can either be an offline process, so it's a process during development. This actually occurs way more often than you might think. For the vast majority of so-called open world games or any game where you have a really, really big map, that map was almost certainly first generated and then tweaked by humans. So basically using a PCG algorithm to give you a decent starting point for your like giant landmass and then tweaking from there. Or uh, instead, these approaches can be online. So they're in a game. Uh, and they're happening every time you're running the game or on certain conditions. So like every time I run a game in Spelunky, right? It's an entirely new uh, adventure every single time. Every time I create a new world in Minecraft, it's an entirely new world every time, but it stays constant uh, throughout that particular playthrough. Uh, there's two major methods we can think of for doing constructive PCG for game spaces. They are constructive grammars which is basically the, the straightforward authoring chunks of a level and the rules for how those chunks can be combined, and noise, which are we can think of as like general rules for transforming random values into more structured output. Um, we can think of while constructive grammars tend to be extremely domain dependent, right? We're authoring literal chunks of levels and rules for how the chunks can be the combined, and that really only makes sense in a particular game. Noise is a much more general approach, right? The, the same noise function can be used in lots of different games in lots of different circumstances. Okay, so let's start with constructive grammars. So constructive grammars are basically the thing I was describing uh, last week with generative grammar. So we have, uh, it's a, again, a type of generative grammar. It has a template with a series of slots. Those slots could be, for example, head, torso, arms, legs, tail, uh, or they could be landing, corridor, drop for like a Spelunky level. There's a set of tokens that can go into each kind of slot and a set of rules for how certain categories of token can interact. Um, so often for this, you end up breaking up your tokens into categories, things like landing, corridor, drop, etc. And then you write rules for these individual categories, these, these sort of types of tokens, rather than writing rules for each individual token. If you want to think about it a different way, we can think about it like we might have a het category that contains all of our different kinds of heads that exist. And we would probably have a rule about how heads interact with torsos, not about how like this specific head interacts with this specific torso. Okay, uh, let's look at an actual example here, um, just in the PowerPoint slides for now, um, of what we were gonna try to do if we were gonna try to generate 3D adventure games. So um, this would be maps for these games or, or levels for these games. You can think of them as like the dungeons in a Zelda game or more recently um, the sort of building in control uh, FPS shooter from last year or the sort of sprawling world map of Sekiro Shadows Die Twice. Looking at these though, we can basically think of them, um, all of these are actually 3D, but we can think of them as a series of 2D shapes that are connected to one another, right? So, okay, that seems fairly straightforward to generate. Let, let's take a look at it. So first we're gonna need a template. Here's our template. We're gonna say that we're gonna have an intro slot, which is gonna go into three mid-section slots or two to three mid-section slots. And then we're gonna have one outro slot. Okay, so now we need categories and tokens in those categories. So here are intro slots, or intro tokens rather, that could go in our intro slot. Our four mid-section tokens that can go in our two to three mid-section slots. And then our outro tokens. Now you'll note, all I've done is I've turned the intro and outro 180 degrees. Um, 
forgive me, I'm limited in my, my shape selections here. Okay, and then for starters, let's just have the rules. Intro and outro connections, which we're going to say are any flat surfaces, must connect to midsections. So that basically means that we have to have some connection between our intro and our midsections, but that midsections don't necessarily have to connect to intro and outro pieces. Okay? All right, so what does this look like? Here's one possible example output from here. We have an intro piece, this one right here. We have two midsection pieces, and we have an outro piece. So this doesn't look terrible. Um, it's not great. We have a, like a weird dead end over here, um, but it, it's not bad. Uh, let's take a look at another output with these same rules, the same setup. Um, well, actually, uh, let's do something where we actually first, <laughs> again, I need to check my slides ahead of time. Let's make a change to our rules. Maybe we say that looks a little bit weird. It looks a little like stuck, uh, a little bit cramped. We're going to add a rule to say midsections must be placed vertically. Now, if we do that, we might end up in a dungeon like this, uh, which is not super great. Uh, this kind of looks like a weird alien figure or a statue again, maybe. Um, let's pretend this intro actually lined up nicely. But then we'd have three of the same midsections and then an outro block, right? So outro, intro, three midsections. Uh, okay, so let's try another rule, or a tweak to this rule, rather. Let's actually change our template as well. So let's say that our midsections always have to have three slots, and we must have at least one vertical section and one horizontal section for every map. So here's another example output. Now this looks maybe a little better, right? We have an intro here, we go into this section, we have like a dead end, but maybe we could put something interesting here like a treasure, and we have to go back over through here and then back out through here. That's not terrible, um, but it potentially could be better. Let's look at another example output. So here's another one. Um, okay, well, I, I take back what I said. This is pretty bad, right? So we'd go in through here. We'd have this weird out uh, uh, dead, dead end right here that looks exactly the same as this section. Then we could go up through this section and then back uh, to the outro. So that's not great. So maybe we, let's add a new rule here, like each midsection may only be used once, okay? So immediately, right, we've constrained our output. We can no longer have levels like this. We can only use, uh, we have to use three of these midsections pieces and we have to use three unique ones. So an example output might look like this. Again, that sort of gets us to the like kind of okay thing where you have a, a dead end uh, and then you have another path that goes through here to the outro. Um, but if we were to look at this, right, Given these rules, we're actually going to keep on getting output that looks basically like this over and over again. Um, so we don't really have a lot of variety. Now, we could fix that in a few ways. Um, we could change up these rules a little bit to give us more flexibility. We could add more intro, midsection, and outro pieces. We could add new pieces to our template and break up our midsection to give us a little bit more fine grain control. Uh, but again, that would lower the, the variety. Um, so these are the kinds of things that you have to balance with a constructive grammar. So let's talk about some downsides to constructive grammars. Um, here is a example uh, from Remnant from the Ashes, which was again a, a recent game, of uh, its world sort of level PCG leading to an inaccessible area where just because of the way the level was generated, it's impossible to get to this little area over here. So that's one big problem with constructive grammars. There's no guarantee that they will create completable levels um, because that's not something that you can easily encode into your rules, right? All of our rules are hyper-local. What can go next to each other, right? Uh, there's some global stuff like uh, counts and things like that, but even then it's really hard to encode insurance that a level will always be playable, always be completable. Now the combinatorics also, so anytime we add anything, so let's say in this example, let's say we added one midsection right here, right? Because of the combinatorics of, of all the possible unique combinations of three midsections, if we had five midsection options, the three intros, the three outros, that explodes, right? Every time we add anything, we, we explode our, our possible output space by a lot. 
So the, the, the numbers we're working with here means that it's functionally impossible to test for all possible output, which means it's totally possible that your generator can make something that you did not want it to make. And unlike with something like a GA, we don't generally do some sort of search afterwards to make sure that like, oh, hey, this level fits certain constraints. And it can take a lot of hand authoring uh, of tokens to ensure that levels are sufficiently varied. Um, a lot of games that I really like that have PCG end up feeling kind of samey after not very long. Uh, and that's, that's a problem that, that PCG can have. And that brings us to our first question. So this one I'm going to give you a little bit more time for. And if you're watching this later on or if you're just, uh, you know, somehow else got this information, I'd recommend taking a little bit more time than usual to think through this one. It's a little complicated. So pick a game or make up a game with multiple levels, dungeons, or challenges. Describe briefly what its templates, tokens, and rules might look like if you were to implement its level generation. Okay? So I'm going to need a little bit more time than usual. Take some time. Think through this. Um, I ask, even if you're watching this later on, actually take some time and think through this. Uh, it's, it's an interesting question and one that's a little bit more complicated than it might come up immediately, which hopefully if you give it some thought, you'll stumble across yourself. Okay? All right. Okay, that seems like enough time. So uh, let's actually just go ahead and move straight along since I gave you an example uh, of my own possible output for a, a particular you know, 3D adventure game levels. And let's talk about noise. So uh, I've given you two examples of noise over here on the right. Um, specifically, they are, hello? Can I not have my, I'd like my, my mouse, please. Hello, can I not have my mouse? 
Let's try that again. Okay, there we go. Hi, mouse. Uh, so over here on the right, we have Perlin noise and we have value noise. So two different kinds of noise. Now, noise was originally developed for texture synthesis um, back in the sort of early-ish days of 3D graphics. Uh, texture is, if you're not familiar, a um, uh, sort of set of instructions for how a 3D object is going to look, right? Um, in terms of its actual texture, it's, it's what it looks like, not instead of its structure. Now, noise takes initially random values on a grid and runs some set of rules over them to give them the appearance of structure. Um, Kate Compton, who is a, a doctor herself, Dr. Kate Compton, um, she calls this flavors of noise. Different noise values, different noise functions give you different flavors where they're useful for different kinds of PCG. So Perlin noise, uh, originally de developed for the movie Tron in 1982, is actually a favorite uh, for PCG landscaping. Um, per Perlin noise is over here on the, the top right. And you can see if we sort of squint, right, we can imagine that we have like mountain ranges here or maybe islands, uh, things like that. I think you'll get a better sense of how this works in just a sec. Um, but Perlin noise actually shows up a ton in games. So Minecraft uh, famously uses Perlin noise as part of its uh, uh, world generation. Looking at this, maybe you can get a sense of like, oh, hey, yeah, those, those actually look pretty similar. And Skyrim um, and other giant land masses for open world games also use things like Perlin noise to be able to do an initial generation of the terrain. Now, uh, you can sort of hopefully get a sense here, right, of, of what Perlin noise is doing. Because Perlin noise sort of takes random values and turns them into things that kind of look like height maps, that means that we can use them in games to uh, reflect our height maps of our, of our content for the games. And other things as well, figuring out like these blobs could instead be, you know, um, biomes in Minecraft, or uh, they could specify where land versus water was, depending on, on the brightness of the pixels in this case. So, uh, all right, all that being said, let's actually take a look at a Unity demo for how this stuff works. This one's gonna be a bit shorter than usual. Just wanna give y'all a sense of how noise can help doing landscape stuff. So here is basically the same setup from the constructive PCG example with the uh, statue generation. Uh, I have our cube. I have three colors that our cube can randomly pick between. And all that's changed here is I have a new map maker script. Now, if this map maker script will open, do, 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 do. what we can see is that we will go from negative uh, 50 to 50 for an X value and negative 50 to 50 for a Y value. We'll instantiate a cube. We will alter that the local uh, scale, the scale of this cube. So it give it a random height, random Y value, and then set it to this position. Um, now we're currently using the Y in place of the Z location, but that's just so that it'll appear flat. Uh, we could instead have this be X, Y, and zero right here, but then it would be sort of uh, just rotated 90 degrees. Okay, so this is based on an example. Before I even hit play, I want you to understand this is basically an example of what Minecraft, for example, because we're just using cubes, would look like if instead of Perlin noise, say we were just using pure random values, right? Just doing a uniform random uh, uh, sampling. Uniform meaning picking evenly from across a set of possibilities. So let's go hit play and take a look. Okay, so uh, here's our default terrain. As you can see, uh, I don't think this looks very much like landscape. Maybe it looks like a really dense cityscape. Um, maybe that's helpful for certain things. Let's go ahead and hit this again. Okay, so here's another example. Looks mostly the same, I think. Similar sort of just random noise. We can see all of our <laughs> thousand cubes. Um, all right, so, okay, that's not all that great. That doesn't look super good in terms of a landscape, right? Do that again. 
again, just sort of random noise bumps all over the place. Okay, so let's try to use some Perlin noise. Okay, so uh, thankfully, Unity comes with a Perlin noise function built in. So let me say this will be our Perlin value. We're going to go ahead and do math f dot Perlin noise. This takes in a float x and y. Let's just go ahead and pass in our x and y that we have. And let's go ahead and take this. This will be a value from 0 to 1. And we're just going to multiply this by 10. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at what that looks like. Now that we're grabbing whatever the Perlin noise should be for this particular location, and then just using that to set the height of our cubes. Hmm, that looks pretty dang flat, huh? Yep, looks pretty dang flat. Well, actually, if we take a look here, we can see that they're slightly different heights. So this red cube, for example, has a height of 4.6527, and this yellow cube has a, a height of 4.6527. Okay, well, those seem pretty similar. Uh, can we get any different values here? No, all right. Well, they seem maybe slightly different, but all the values look pretty darn similar to me. This looks pretty darn flat. Well, part of the problem here is that this Perlin noise uh, function, what is it's functionally doing, ha ha ha, is producing a giant map that's just static. This is always the same. So what we're doing is we're sort of looking at a particular position at that map. And so it might be that um, the way that we're looking with these sort of massive integer values isn't quite right. We need to normalize. So let's go ahead and just divide by 100f. Uh, so a turning this into a float value, turning them both into float values, and go ahead and normalize. So we were basically querying the same point or the similar points across that math that uh, this Perlin noise function values. We can hit play again. Hmm. Okay. So once again, this looks pretty similar. Though actually, looking at it at this. From here, we can see things look a little different. So over here, we have 3.025 as our height. And over here, we have 4.7. OK, so that's clearly worked. But this is maybe not the right scale to be working at with, rather, for our specific needs, right? So I'm going to do this little trick where instead, we're basically going to make bigger jumps. So this Perlin function's a little bit too smooth. We just want it to be a little bit more uh, blocky because <laughs> this is Minecraft, or rather an approximation. OK, hey, now look at that. That's starting to look pretty good, huh? Now, obviously, this still looks like a speckled nightmare. But uh, overall, this looks a lot more like a landscape, right? We have like these rolling hills. This looks pretty decent. OK. So uh, here's the thing, though. Every time we run this, because we're querying this big pre-computed thing, it's going to be the same. So rather than that, let's add a, uh, a random offset. So every time we run this code, we have some random offset. We could think of this as you know something like a, a key that we could use to query different maps. So I'm going to add an offset value up here random.range, do 1 to 1,000. OK. And let's just go ahead and add this offset to our x and y values here. Jump back into Unity. And OK, so that's what that one looks like. Let's hit this again. OK. All right, there's another one. And another one. Nice. Thick section here with a couple humps. Jones this again. All right, a couple humps at the start, et cetera, et cetera, right? So uh, this looks better. It looks more like a landscape, but we still have this weird patchwork effect. So let's see what we could do about that. So I'm going to go ahead and go into this pick a random color script, which is 
Right now, just after we instantiate this object, it's going to randomly pick from one of these indexes. And I'm going to go ahead and change this into a, uh, a public function called pick a color. And we're going to use a float random val right here. We're going to take our random val, which will be our 0 to 1 Perlin val, uh, noise value, to be clear, multiply it by 3, and then turn it into an integer. So now back in our map maker, I'm going to go ahead and for each of these new cube objects, I'm going to get it, pick a random color. I am going to uh, call its public function pick a color and pass in our Perlin value. Okay, so let's go ahead. Oop. Oh, whoops, forgot to turn this into a function. There we go. Let's hit this again, see what happens. Okay, now let's take a look at that. So this is interesting, right? We have this sort of weird looking world. Let's jump into our, our scene view. Weird looking world where we have sort of lava pools down below and then hills of blue with little yellow patches on top. Let's hit this again. Okay, and again, new world. Hit it again. Uh, oops. <laughs> Got an index out of range exception. Index out of range exception. These indexes are a little bit too high. Uh, let's jump back over here. Part of this problem is we could have up to an index three. We only have two indexes. So I'm going to multiply this by uh, three, and then I'm going to do um, int or random, rather, random index equals, let's just clamp it to the right thing. Um, min math f dot min random index or two. Make sure that at most it can be two, which are the number of colors that we have access to. Okay, so another one, another one, another one. Cool. So as you might have noticed, um, we had a rather weird thing where our, our sort of uh, world looks like it has a lot of lava maybe. But if we just change out these colors so that zero is our lowest depth, in this case what we want water to be, and then we could have our next highest depths be, say, ground. We'll pick an orange for that. And then our highest uh, thing to be, I don't know, snow, for example. So let's go back over here. Hit this again. Okay, so we have a uh, cyan watery world with these orangish uh, uh, dirt <laughs> pieces and then little white topped uh, mountains. Do it again. Okay. That looks not half bad, right? You can imagine how using this as a base, we could spiral this out into a, a whole game and, and wander around these sort of generated things, maybe plop down some plants and some structures, some villages, maybe some monsters, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, with that, I'm gonna head back to the slides. Okay, so hopefully that Unity demo was helpful to give you a sense of how noise can be really impactful, especially uh, much more useful than, say, just a pure random query, whether that be for the colors of your objects or the textures of your objects or the heights of your objects for when you're producing landscapes. Okay, so summary of noise. You can get something that can look okay or looks okay, I guess, uh, quite quickly. Maybe this sentence should uh, look better, look more okay. It does require some expertise to know how to adapt your specific use case. So I had to use the fact that I sort of knew how Perlin noise worked uh, in that specific implementation in Unity to know, okay, how do I shift the values that I'm calling from to be able to get something that looks good, right? How, how to scale these values to fit my specific use case and how to use it to be able to, you know, get the colors to, to look right. Now, same with a grammar, uh, there's no way to guarantee that specific criteria like completability or interestingness, et cetera, are gonna be true of your generated thing. It's just not possible. So in an offline situation where we generate a landscape first and then we edit it from there, that's fine. We as a human, you, we as humans designers can, can enforce certain things. But if this is just happening at runtime, there's no way to know what you're gonna get. 
So that brings us to constructed PCG for game scenarios. So these are the uh, game stories, game quests, things like this. Now, notably, <laughs> this is much the same. We don't have noise here. Uh, we don't have this like nice general functions that can be used to represent things like spaces or, or organic material, et cetera, et cetera. But we can do the similar thing with templates. So quest templates tend to look like having location, for example. Oh, hello. Can I? Why did it do the thing again where it wouldn't let me? Uh, here we go. Okay. Uh, templates like location, which have slots that can be filled with specific values, like a location category. Tokens, that these are the elements that can fill these variables. And then rules. So these are the constraints between vari variables that limit the types of values we can place on them, right? So let's, let's ground that as an example. So both Skyrim and Fallout 4, both from Bethesda, have radiant quests. These are things that certain quest givers, people, NPCs in the world, people in the world can basically say like, hey, go to location, talk to NPC blank, and then do verb, collect, kill, um, explore, uh, X things. So you'd often get a thing where you'd say, go to this particular location and kill this particular thing at this particular location. That might be a type of quest. And the location would change, right? The location could be changed. The thing that could be there would be changed. There might be some rules about certain kinds of monsters only occurring at certain locations. Um, or uh, for Fallout 4, which is this post-apocalyptic world, there might be some rules about certain locations can only have certain kinds of raiders, for example, or, or other kind of mutated creatures that might be there. But then on generation, all we need to do is select a template and fill in these values with whatever types we have available to us. Uh, now, nobody was praising these radiant quests all that much. They're not particularly interesting. In fact, if you've ever played Mad Libs, that's basically what's happening here, right? And just like with Mad Libs, while it might be fun if you could just put whatever variable, you know, whatever uh, tokens you want, because then you can just make everything fart, for example, uh, and maybe you're, you know, eight and that's very funny to you. In, in this example, we have a limited number of tokens that can go each of those slots. It can't be really surprising in terms of what goes there. And that's by design. We don't want, if we're the designers of these games, we don't want quests that like entirely break the game, right? But it tends to lead to things that are a bit boring. So quest templates, there's some pros. They're fast, they're basically, it's a generative grammar again, so it's very, very fast. It can be customized to the player experience, right? So if you have only unlocked certain locations, we can just say, okay, uh, there's a rule. We can only use locations the player's unlocked. Cons. Again, basically, it's Mad Libs, where you do the same Mad Lib over and over and over again. No matter how funny it was the first time that you used fart for every single verb, it's not going to be funny the tenth time. Or maybe it starts being funny again. Uh, humor's weird. Regardless, though, this is not a Mad Lib. This is not something where you get to put it wherever you want. You're going to start seeing the fact that this is just a template as you do these things over and over again. So they get boring pretty quickly. So that brings us to the second and final question. What could we do that's a bit more interesting than just a constructive grammar or templating for a quest or story generation in games? Again, I'm gonna give you a few more minutes than usual this time because I think this is an interesting thing I really want you to take your time and think about. What could we do? A uh, hint for those of you actually in the class, uh, we've talked about some approaches that might be helpful here. All right, okay.
Okay, so uh, my answer for this, well, really, uh, these folks' answer, uh, Fred Charles, Mark Carvaza, and Stephen Mead's answer, is to use planning, uh, specifically hierarchical task networks. There's a couple of videos here that I recommend checking out in just the slides or pausing this and typing it in, but these go over examples from them all of uh, using planning and hierarchical task network specifically to be able to sort of have interactive fiction, right? Which let the player do whatever they want and the story tries to adapt to them. This is very similar to the tech behind the new game or newish game Elsinore, right? In which you might make changes to the plot of Hamlet and the different actors attempt to adapt the plot to your changes, right? They do their best to fit whatever they're trying to do. They're fit their goals to the world changes that you've made. And that can lead to much more interesting and exciting things. I, there's a, I really recommend checking out Elsinore if you haven't yet. It's a really interesting game. There's at least you know some Let's Plays you can check out. So that brings us to the end of this. Um, we're done with, with uh, mostly we're done with constructive uh, PCG. We're going to on Wednesday talk about constraint-based PCG, but really we're going to start talking about machine learning and PCG. Uh, with the new hotness, the new uh, new cool approach, wave function collapse. All right, talk to you then.